We will be reading from Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 30. As you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word as a sign of his authority over us. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and thus said to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation." Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. 
And who, he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be no, made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. This is God's word. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, my name is Scott. I uh, have the privilege of teaching us this morning from Daniel chapter 2. And I'm excited to do this. This is a great passage. Uh, if I haven't met you before, uh, I serve as an elder here. Um, and let's jump in because there's a lot here. Thanks for the long reading. Um, <clears throat> how many of you guys have ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? That's Okay, good. We're still a lot of people. I mean, you remember at the beginning of the movie, like before you actually get into the story, uh, that whole movie is set up as Peter Falk, this grandfather, is reading a story to his grandson. And at the beginning of the movie, he's trying to sell the idea of, of reading the story while his grandson is sick. And the grandson is like, are there sports? Like, am I going to like this book? And he's not too sure about it. And Peter Falk, the, the actor who plays the grandfather, says, oh, yeah, there's fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, Giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. And the grandson's like, oh, okay, that's, that, sounds, that sounds all right. We'll, we'll give it a try. I kind of feel like we could make a list like that for the book of Daniel. This is an amazing book with crazy stories in it. This story alone is fantastic, right? You've got this tyrant king. You've got deceptive advisors. You've got execution orders for this whole class of people. Visions, miracles. We might be missing the monsters in this story and I don't know of any true love. I don't think there's a six-fingered man in this book. But this is a great story. As we go through, we're gonna find it breaks up into four sections. And that'll be kind of the way I progress through this morning. In the first six verses, we see the demands of the king. Seven through 13, we see the deception of the advisors. Verses 14 through 18, we see the desperation of Daniel and his friends. And in 19 through 30, we see the deliverance of God. So we'll just take that section by section and talk about each one. And at the end, we'll talk about how this stuff connects to us. So let's start with the first six verses, the demand of the king. So at the very beginning, we see that Daniel has a dream. Or actually, it says dreams. So this might be a recurring thing. And Daniel, real, or not Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is having this dream. And Nebuchadnezzar realizes this isn't just a dream, but this is some sort of a vision. And as he experienced this vision, he is very disturbed by it. Now, if you want to hear about the dream, you're going to have to come back next week because we're stopping the story before we actually get to the dream and its interpretation this week. But come back next week and you'll learn about this disturbing dream. But as the king experienced this dream and was disturbed by it, he knew that he needed to figure out what it meant. He needed to get to the truth that this dream was revealing. Now the king isn't stupid. He knew that dream interpretation is very subjective. Anyone could say anything they want and claim that that's the proper interpretation. Like if you came and told me a dream, I could just make something up and you don't know if that's right or if it's wrong. I don't know if it's right or wrong. There's no way to know what the true interpretation of that dream is. Well, the king has this whole group of people that he consults with. At various points in the story, they're called magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, diviners, and wise men. I'm going to call them advisors because that's the purpose that they function for the king. And that's a term that we're more familiar with. I'm not going to get super deep into who these people are, but as I was doing some reading about this, there are many people who think that this is the class of people that the Magi came from, who came to visit Jesus uh, 
at the beginning of the gospel accounts. I don't know if that's true or not. It's one of the theories. Um, We'll just call them advisors from here on out, though. The king comes up with a test for his advisors. He tells them, you've got to not just interpret the dream, but I'm not even going to tell you what the dream is. You've got to tell me the dream and then interpret it. Now, his thinking here is that he has no objective way to verify if their interpretation is correct because he doesn't know what the right interpretation is. So he's going to make them tell him the dream that he's never told them, which he can objectively verify, objectively verify if they're right. And then if they can do that, then he's going to trust them with the interpretation of the dream. You see the logic there? If they can do the really hard thing that I can't prove, I can trust them to do the thing I can't prove as well. And he gives them plenty of incentive. He says, succeed and you'll be rich. I'll give you power, position, money, it'll be great. Fail and you'll die. Oh, and I'll, I'll go tear down your house as well. So it's not just going to affect them, but it's going to affect their whole family, right? Uh, he's given him all kinds of motive to get this right. He is not kidding around. This is high stakes, right? I really want to know the truth of this dream, and I'm going to give you every reason I can to come up with it. Let's look at the advisor's reaction and their deception. So initially, they brush off the king's request. Like, <laughs> good one, king, very funny. <laughs> go ahead and tell us the dream now. Okay, let, let's go back and tell us the dream. The king stands firm. He's like, no, uh, this is really what it is. He even gets a, a little bit testy with them. And this is the response that the advisors give to the king, starting in verse 10. They say, there is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not walk among men. Remember at the beginning of our story, it said that this is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He's still new at this job. And all of his advisors are kind of like, hey, you got to know how this works. This isn't how kings deal with their advisors. They, they're more reasonable. You, you can't ask something like that. Interestingly, as you get towards the end of what they said, they really land on some honest truth. They say no one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they go on to say, and they do not live among men. So they're basically saying that only God can do this and we don't have access to him. And that's ultimately what the king wanted to find out. And now it's out in the open. See, he doesn't, the king doesn't just want a flawed, potentially flawed human reasoning to interpret his dream. The king wanted to get to the truth from God. And now they've been forced to admit that they can't give it to him. Because they knew they didn't have access to divine truth. Now, I don't doubt that they had been giving the king their best, most reasonable advice up through this point in his kingship. But they didn't really know what was true. They're just doing their human best. And the king is furious. Wipe them all out. Kill every last one of them. Even the ones who are in training to take this job in the future. So remember at the beginning of our passage, we find out that this is only the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. So Daniel and his friends, they're still in that three-year training, formation, assimilation program that Nebuchadnezzar had put them in. Now there's a chance that they're restarting the count of Nebuchadnezzar's reign based upon some significant thing that might have happened, but I don't think that's what's going on. I don't think Daniel and his guys were were done with that three years of training. That's why they're not there, because we find out in a moment that they haven't even been a part of this conversation. 
that even them, even these guys in training, are included in this edict of death. Let's look at the desperation of Daniel and his friends. So it's apparent that Daniel and those guys were not a part of this whole interaction with the king. So he doesn't find out about it until they come to collect him for his execution. And understandably, he wants to know what's going on. He's like, hey, wait a minute. What's this all about? And I love what we're told about his response. It says, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. If there was ever a situation to freak out about, this would be it, right? Somebody comes to your door, he's with the government, he says, hey, we're taking you off to kill you. Ah! Daniel responded with wisdom and tact. He's not defiant or combative in the face of ungodly authority acting in an ungodly way. It's like, no, I'm going to respond with wisdom and tact. We saw that last week too, didn't we? When Daniel and his friends were initially told no to going on their special diet, he tactfully proposes to his guard a trial run. Give us 10 days and see how we look. Basically, he tried to make it easier for the guard to say yes. And he showed understanding of the predicament that the guard was in. Because guard was saying, hey, if, if you're not healthy, it's, it's on my head. And my head might not stay on my head. <laughs> so Daniel, again, last week and now again this week, he gives this very tactful response. I really think that we as the church can learn a lot from Daniel about living as exiles. The church doesn't always respond to ungodly authority with tact, do we? I'm not claiming that tact will always work, but it sure seems like a better place to start than immediate defiance, combativeness. In this situation, Daniel calmly asks what's going on, and when he finds out, he gets permission to go to the king, says to the king, hey, don't kill everybody yet, give me a chance, I'll come back to you with an answer. And then he calls a prayer meeting, (laughs) right? He's like, okay, we need to pray. You know, if you think about this story as it relates to truth, the king wanted the truth. He demanded the truth, really. The advisors pretended to have it. Everyone in the story seems to know that only God can grant the truth. And unlike the other advisors, Daniel knows that he has access to God. And therefore, he has access to the truth. Can you imagine the flavor of this prayer meeting? God has what we need. If he gives it, we'll live. If he doesn't give it, we'll die. So Daniel urged them to plead for mercy. They are fully aware of the situation they're in and their desperate need before God. As a side note, I want my prayer to look more like that. I want our prayer meetings to look more like that. Not that every prayer meeting would be a life and death situation, I'm not saying that, but that we would recognize our desperation and our ultimate need for him and that we would go to him to provide what only he can provide. Recognizing, recognizing that he has what we need and pleading with him that he would bring it. Did Daniel know that God would provide the vision when he went before the king and said, wait? Well, he certainly knew that God could. But I really doubt that he knew God would. Even in the next chapter of Daniel, and we'll, we'll get to this in in either next week or the week after, um, we see these guys that they're about to be thrown in the furnace and they say, we know God can save us, but we don't know if he will. I think Daniel's in the same situation. He's like, I know God can give me this vision, but we need to pray because we need God to actually do it. I think Daniel was trusting God, not knowing what was to come. 
Now in the story, we are not left long to wonder what happens. God delivers them. That very first night, we don't actually know how long Daniel was granted reprieve, but in the very first night, God gives Daniel the king's vision. And Daniel responds in worship. I'm going to read to you verses 20 to 23 because I just think Daniel's response is fantastic. He says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Daniel's response to getting this vision is to worship God. He proclaims several things here. He proclaims God's worth. He proclaims God's wisdom, his power, his authority over the natural world and kings. He proclaims God's provision. He declares that God gives wisdom, reveals what's hidden, knows what's in the darkness, and dwells with light. You see some fantastic themes there of the majesty and power and glory of God and the knowledge and wisdom of God. I don't think these things are new realizations for Daniel. But this experience has acted to confirm them and bring them to the surface for him. Remember, Daniel is young. He was taken out of Israel as a teenager. And this is just a a year or two later. He's a teenager. And he's living in exile. And he's constantly being bombarded with an alternate claim to the truth. None of these beliefs are being reinforced by the surrounding culture. So when God confirms them, it would be incredibly affirming and exciting Plus, it's pretty cool that they're not all going to be executed in the next few days. But that's not what he praises God for. He doesn't say, oh, God, thank you that you spared us. He's like, God, thank you for being who you are. Thanks for revealing yourself. This is who you are. You're incredible. So Daniel goes before the king. And the king very quickly, I don't know if he's on the edge of his seat. I kind of suspect he was because he really wants the vision. He's like, did you get it? Are you able to do it? And Daniel's response is great. Daniel replies, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Daniel doesn't claim any of the credit. In fact, a little bit later, he says he's not any wiser than the other men. But rather, he testifies to the king that there is a God in heaven who knows all and can reveal all. Daniel isn't content to simply give the answer that will save his life and the life of all the other advisors. He wants to make sure that this earthly king knows that there is a heavenly king. And so he testifies to who this king is. I hope that you know what Daniel knows. God is the ultimate authority. He knows all truth. In him is wisdom. He has power He is able to reveal mysteries. Living in exile, like Daniel was, we are constantly being bombarded with an alternate claim to the truth. But God is the truth. 
what he says is true. Just like Daniel, we have access to God. So we have access to the truth. And I don't know if you'll ever need the kind of kind of supernatural revelation that Daniel had that night. I don't know if you'll ever be in the need for that kind of revelation. But as believers today, we have the truth. How do we have God's truth? We have God's word. God's word is a revelation of the truth. Right here, written form. We can go to it day and night, whenever we need. This is the truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. This is God's word to us. This is true no matter what the world around us says. This is true. We have God's spirit indwelling us, leading us into all truth. Carrot prayed that right before I came up. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, Jesus is telling what's coming after he dies. He's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So we have God's word and we have God's spirit to lead us into truth. And those two things act in conjunction a lot. There's one more way that we have access to the truth. We have Jesus. He's the ultimate revelation of truth. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. He reveals truth to us. Colossians 2, 3 says, Paul, he's writing about Christ. He says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Hidden in Christ, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Because he's the truth. If you were a part of our church when we were preaching through the book of Hebrews, we read this as our creed every week, so this will sound very familiar if you were with us for that series. It's Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. and He upholds the universe by the word of his power. God spoke to us in the prophets, but now he's revealed himself to us in his son. He's the exact imprint of his nature, the radiance of the glory of God. We have access to truth. It's been revealed to us in Christ It's written down for us in the word and the spirit leads us into that truth. And those three things may seem less supernatural than what Daniel experienced, but it's not. God's word and the spirit and Jesus are just as supernatural. And that's how you and I can know the truth. Here's the deal. Because we have access to the truth, we can live our lives aligned to that truth. And that kind of life, aligned to truth that comes outside of ourself, that is a supernatural life. We know the rules. We've read the playbook. The world around us doesn't have that. And so we're not going to live in the same way that it is because we're living our lives in line with truth that it doesn't have access to, truths that it doesn't know. Take, for example, contentment in the face of hardship or love in the face of persecution. Those reactions make no sense in the playbook that the world is living by but we know the truth. We serve a God who's in control and his loving hand will hold us to the end. We don't need justice or vindication or glory out of this life. None of that makes sense to the world. 
Sometimes when the world sees that in us, it recognizes the truth of it. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just looks at us and thinks, you're crazy. Sometimes it breaks beneath the surface and people will say, wait a minute. There's something there. We actually will see that lived out in the life of Daniel and his friends in the coming weeks as we continue on through the book of Daniel. As I was thinking about this, that us living this kind of a supernatural life will sometimes break beneath the surface of people. Uh, I thought of a couple stories from a book that's written by Voice of the Martyrs. Um, I'm not going to read this whole story, but it's, this is a story that comes out of Cambodia. A man named Haim and his family were believers. This is in the 1970s, and the communists were killing Christians in a very systematic way. And they had caught uh, Haim and his family, and they were not denying their faith. The killers allowed them a chance to pray, and they made them dig a grave for themselves. And right before they were about to be shot, Haim's son bolts out and gets into the jungle and gets away. And the soldiers were going to go hunt him down. And the father said, let me call to him. So the father calls to him. And I'll, I'll read this section. He says, think, my son, he shouted. Can stealing a few more days of life as a fugitive in that forest compare to joining your family here on the grave, but soon to be free forever in paradise? As weeping, the boy walked back. Haim said to his executioners, now we're ready to go. But none of the soldiers would kill him. In the end, an officer who had not witnessed the scene came and shot them. So the soldiers that were there saw. They could tell there was something going on there. that They didn't know. That's, again, another pretty extreme example that I hope none of us ever face. (laughs) But I was thinking about, there's been a number of times in my adult life where I've been given wrong change as I'm checking out of the grocery store. And when I catch it, I I give them back the money. I've only noticed when I'm given more than I deserve. And I I give it back to them. And, And almost every time that's happened, the checkout person is just kind of flabbergasted. And my reaction has always been to say, well, it's not mine, (laughs) which is true, but they're seeing something that they don't expect, and that's an opportunity for me to testify to the power of God. The real answer is, I'm a believer. (laughs) I'm a Christian. It's not right for me to steal. And the next time that happens, I want to remember to say that and not just say, oh, it's not mine. So I think there's everyday things, it's not just life and death, where we get to live and testify to this supernatural life that we get to live because we know the truth. So we can live a supernatural and attractive life because we have access to the revealer of mysteries and he's told us what's really true. Let me pray. God, I am so grateful that you have revealed yourself to us. You've given us your word, you've given us your spirit. And that Jesus, you came and lived a life revealing the glory of God. I pray that we would live in light of that truth, that we wouldn't just sit it on the shelf, but we would live our lives aligned to that truth. And I do pray that it would be attractive to the people around us. Or like Daniel, we live as exiles. Help us to hold firm to the truth that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.